I want to welcome you to Jaffrey Bible Church's service for March the 22nd here in 2020. We are grateful you could join us. Whether you are a member, a regular attender, a first-time visitor, we welcome each and every one of you in this unique platform for us. Uh, maybe you're a person who somebody just sent a link to and you're watching this from another part of the country. Wherever you are, we want to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. Though we're separated by distance, we're united by faith, by love, and by hope because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're grateful we could be together today. We pray that you will soon, that all of us will soon be able to gather together to worship. But until then, we're going to keep posting these services online and gather as a community over the internet. Now, as we often start our services with prayer, we're going to pray, and we're going to pray for the country of Yemen this morning. Uh, the country of Yemen has about 30 million people, and 99.92% of them are Muslim. There is 0.08% Christians. That's about 4,300 people out of 30 million. And Yemen is one of the top 10 nations when it comes to persecution of believers. So as we pray, we'll pray for Yemen. And this will be providential because what we're doing today, worshiping together in the quietness of our homes, is what Christians have to do in Yemen because of persecution from family as well as others. So join me as we begin with a word of prayer this morning. Father, I thank you that you have given us a technology to be able to meet as a body. Though we are scattered and separated from one another, we are united in spirit. And so we thank you for that. Lord, I do pray that you would be pleased to do a great work in us, in our country, in our world. Lord, there is so much that's happening because of this coronavirus. But Lord, for many people, there's other difficulties as well. Many are suffering with uh, pain. Many are struggling, Father, with the other diseases. And so, Father, we pray for your healing hand, and we pray that you would be pleased to touch lives. Father, we want to pray for the country of Yemen as well. Lord, as many of us are gathered in our own homes as we watch this, we begin to, to glimpse what it's like to be a Christian in Yemen, except we're doing this voluntarily. Lord, the only way they can do it is just to come quietly together in one or two people at a time in most instances. Father, I pray for a breakthrough in the country of Yemen. I pray that you would accomplish great things there. Lord, that the persecution would cause your church to really burn brightly, Father, and that you would be pleased to touch lives and to touch hearts. And Father, for us this morning, as we worship together in music, as we worship together through the teaching of your word, as we fellowship with one another in our own homes, that you be pleased to minister to us. And so we commit this service to you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we uh, start our service, we're going to have some music. Now, you are in the quietness of your home, so you can just listen along. You will have the words on the screen for you to follow along with them. You can sing as loud as you want to, because it's just going to be you and your family. So join us as we begin with a time of singing to the glory of Jesus. Lord of all creation Of water, earth, and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord Almighty God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy Holy, the universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth. 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 
light When I stumble in the darkness I will call your name by night God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1 and uh, hopefully you've got a set of notes off the website. If not, you can get some later and be able to uh, follow along or use those to to write on. Uh, So uh, as we pray, uh, please remember those who are dealing with the coronavirus as well as those who are dealing with health issues and uh, in grief at this time in our community. And so let's just pray as we normally do by asking God to speak to us. So would you just join me in a word of silent prayer where you are, and then when I pray, you can pray along with me, Lord, speak to me. So let's pray. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, speak to me. Amen. So let's begin with just a quick review as we've been walking through the book of Romans. Paul begins with his salutation to the Romans. Uh, Even in his salutation, Paul gives much information about himself, his calling and his message, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who was both fully God and fully man, who came to provide salvation for us. And, and next we saw in Romans 1, 8-15, Paul's love for the Romans. In this section, he shares his love for the Roman people whose faith was well known because of their faith and faithfulness to God in the things that he's done in their lives. Now, I want us, as we begin this morning, to reflect on the heart of God, which is going to bring us to Paul's theme in the book of Romans. First, look at the heart of God the Father, as found in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32. It says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, he says, Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? 
God the Father's heart is that people would turn and repent. And that they would not die and spend eternity separated from Him. That's His desire for all people. How about the desire of God the second person, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, we have the Great Commission. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mark presents the Great Commission in this manner. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The heart of Jesus is to see the world, all creation, reach with the message of the gospel. A gospel which produces disciples, not just converts. That same heart and passion was captured by the Apostle Paul when he was captured by the Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote about it in so many places, but one I want to highlight for us as we get started is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. Paul wrote, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that by all means I may save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. His passion was to share the message of Jesus with a lost and dying world. Martin Luther, the reformer, wrote, The Christian man is the most free man of all and subject to none. The Christian man is the most dutiful slave of all and subject to all. That was Paul's heart. And he clearly portrays that in his theme in the book of Romans. Now he prepares us for his theme by sharing three I am statements about himself. These statements will teach us a lot about the Apostle Paul. Follow along with me as I read Romans chapter 1 verses 14 through 17. Paul said, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Let's begin this section by looking at Paul's three I am statements. First, verse 14, I am under obligation. Paul said, I am a debtor. When I was in college, we used to sing a song that had these words in it. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. All of us are obligated to God for what He did for us. But notice, that's not what the Apostle Paul wrote in verse 14. He said, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. He knows that he's indebted to God, but he takes it further. Because of all that God did for him, because of the salvation in Jesus Christ, Paul felt indebted to all people as well, to everyone, to Greeks and to barbarians. To to the Greek people, all non-Greeks were seen as barbarians. 
the Romans maintained that same mentality. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 11 we read a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man. But Christ is all and in all. The idea is those who are cultured and those who are not cultured. And he emphasizes that in his next comment, both to the wise and to the foolish. Paul is sharing his testimony in Acts chapter 22, verses 14 and 15. In that section, he starts talking about Ananias, who had, came, who had come to him from God, laid his hands on him, where Paul received his eyesight again, and he gives him a word from God. Ananias said to him, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Though Paul was specifically called to the Gentiles, he still felt obligated to share with all people, with all men. We are called to represent Jesus Christ to all people. And like Paul, we're indebted or obligated to do that. When I was fresh out of college, I worked for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes in the Dallas area. Our office was in the town of Richardson, which is a very large suburb of Dallas. A very large church there was First Baptist Church of Richardson. It was pastored by a man named Dr. Jim Keith. Uh, I just found out today as I looked up some stuff on Dr. Keith that he passed away a few years ago. But I really liked and appreciated Jim. The first time that he ever shared with our staff, he came in, he said he had played football at Mississippi State. While at Mississippi State, he came to know Jesus Christ in a personal way through the ministry of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Dr. Keith told us that he felt indebted to FCA because it was the vehicle that God used to bring him to Jesus Christ. But then he said the following. He said, but FCA keeps giving me opportunities to share. And every time I get those opportunities, if I'm able, I take them. And I go deeper in debt to FCA just for the ministry, just for the opportunity to be involved in further service. To be able to speak to people that I wouldn't normally have the opportunity to speak to. Is that not how we should be as believers? We're indebted to God in such a way that, that it should cause us to be obligated to others, to, to feel indebted to them. And by having the opportunities to share Christ with others, that takes us deeper in debt to what God has done for us. Paul understood that obligation. But you know, he didn't just simply share out of obligation. Verse 15 tells us that he was eager. It was his delight to be able to share. You know, a number of years ago, Karen and I had the opportunity to attend an event with FCA down at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Florida. It was in Palm Beach, Florida. It was a major donor event for FCA. Every time someone served us in the Ritz-Carlton and we thanked them for it, their immediate reply was, my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I couldn't believe how many people we had the opportunity to bring pleasure to simply by serving us. Paul was eager to serve. It brought him pleasure to serve Jesus. He was not only obligated, he, 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 had, he was delighted. He wanted to serve. First, to preach the gospel. Paul wanted to be a soul winner. He wanted to reach others for Christ. Paul wanted to get to Rome so that he could preach the gospel so that he could win souls for Jesus. He wanted to bear fruit among them also. Even as among the other Gentiles. But he had another reason for wanting to go to Rome. For being eager to go there. It was partly to set the record straight. They probably wondered why he had not come to them 
as of yet. Is it possible that the gospel that he shared in other cities just really won't bear fruit in a city like Rome? Uh, Would this gospel stand the test of the capital of the Roman Empire? Was he too afraid to come to them? Or possibly too ashamed? He was obligated. He was eager. And he's going to make it very clear that he is not ashamed. That's his declaration. He wanted everybody to know about his relationship with Jesus. Verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why would he be ashamed? Why would that even be a question to them? Well, think about it from their perspective. In their minds, he was proclaiming Jesus. Jesus was a Jewish carpenter, which meant that he was poor. He was a common laborer from a people who were despised and who had been defeated by the Romans. That's already two strikes against him. Rome was a proud city, and the best that the Jews had to offer was the city of Jerusalem, which was now occupied by the Romans. So that's strike number three from their perspective. But Paul made it very clear that he was not ashamed to be identified with Jesus or with his gospel. Matthew Henry had a great statement as I was reading through various commentaries. He said, I reckon him a Christian indeed that is neither ashamed of the gospel nor a shame to the gospel. Paul was neither ashamed of the gospel and he was not ashamed to the gospel. May that be true of you and may that be true of me that we would not bring shame to the name of Christ by the way that we live our lives and that we would not be ashamed of the gospel. So why was Paul not ashamed of this gospel? Let's look at what he says in the text. First, because it is the power of God for salvation. That is the result of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Salvation means deliverance, which is seen in a progressive way as you look at the as it unfolds in the scriptures. First, there is deliverance in the past from the penalty of sin. That is the ministry of justification, as we refer to it, which is us being declared righteous by God. Salvation allows that to happen before a holy God. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. Paul is going to deal with that in chapters 3, 4, and 5. But salvation is not only in the past, it's also in the present. It is God's salvation gives us deliverance from the power of sin here and now in the lives that He's called us to live. That is sanctification, being set apart to God. Paul will deal with that in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. Thirdly, there's a yet future aspect of our salvation And that's freedom from the presence of sin. In glory, our position in Christ and our practice in Christ are going to be the same. Before you and I became Christians, for those of us who are Christians, our position matched our practice. We didn't know Jesus and we behaved that way. Even those of us who were moral and behaved well still did it with wrong motives still did it with selfish motives. And our best deeds are as filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. Now as Christians, in our sanctification, our position in Christ is perfect, but our practice doesn't quite match up to our position. Hopefully progressive sanctification allows us to keep maturing, but we're still in process. In glory, our position in our practice, will be identical. They're going to be one. Praise the Lord for that. For that great transformation that God does. So, the gospel, first of all, is the power of God for salvation. Notice the range of it. It's to everyone. To Jews and to Greeks. As he tells us a little bit later. First to the Jew and then to the Greek. The gospel is for all people. To the Jew first, because chronologically it came to them first. It came to Israel. 
When, when the apostles carried the message of the gospel, it went to the Jews first, and then to the Greeks or the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Now it mostly goes to the Gentiles, but we must not forget the Jews. And Paul is going to address that in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Now please hear this. You just heard me say, don't forget the Jews. And that came from a Palestinian. Because the gospel is for all people. And we carry the message to everyone. But there's also a requirement that we have to look at. It isn't just for everyone in and of themselves. It's to everyone who believes Faith is integral. In general, the message of salvation goes to everyone, but in specific, it only applies to those who receive Christ by faith. It has to be united with faith and belief. Time and time again, the Bible keeps us coming back to the area of faith. And that takes us to the theme of the book of Romans, which is found in verse 17. For in it, that it is a reference to the gospel, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. As we first look at the righteousness of God here, we have to think of what does that really mean? To me, the simplest definition of the word righteousness or righteous is simply to be in the right. God is righteous because He's always in the right. And you and I are righteous when we do what is right. You know, the same root for the word righteousness, righteous, just, justified. In the Greek, they're all the same root. In those words in that root, appear over 60 times in the book of Romans. It's a huge thought for the Apostle Paul. Paul tells us, this, for the righteousness of God is revealed. God has demonstrated or made known His righteousness. How? Well, the primary way is to look at Jesus Christ and to look at the cross. His coming, His life, His death, his resurrection. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He that is God the Father made Him that is God the Son who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. God's righteousness is revealed. How? First, in Christ's crucifixion. Jesus Christ bore our sin when He went to the cross. He bore the wrath of God on our behalf so that the righteousness of God would be satisfied. Jesus Christ was punished for you and for me. So God's righteousness is revealed because He has to punish sin. And Jesus bore that on our behalf. But secondly, God's righteousness is revealed in Christ's resurrection. That in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The resurrection is proof that God's righteousness has been satisfied. It is the evidence for all of us that His wrath has been appeased and that Jesus Christ has borne our sin upon Himself. And that resurrection shows that God approved of that. And now God approves of us because of Christ. If God was not pleased with Christ, He would still be in the grave. But He isn't. Because Jesus always does the things that are pleasing to His Father. Next we see that this righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. From faith to faith has the idea of out of faith and into faith. It begins, it ends, and all in between is by faith. 
It begins with faith. It builds on that faith. It continues in that faith. And then it goes to more faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Faith is the key which unlocks the door. In one sense you could say faith is the master key that unlocks every door when it comes to God. Because without faith it's impossible to please God. And then he talks about not only this righteousness of God that's revealed here, is that there is a righteousness that's given to us as people. He quotes Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The whole verse in Habakkuk said, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. You know, that little text is quoted three times in the New Testament. It really is a theme to three key books in the New Testament. And each one of those books takes its theme from part of this verse. But the righteous man shall live by faith. First, the righteous man. That's Romans 1.17, the just. That's what we're looking at here. The book of Romans' focus is on the righteousness of God, which has been revealed. Secondly, but the righteous man shall live. That's from Galatians 3.11, we read the following. Now, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. The focus of the book of Galatians is our life, our walk, our life in the Spirit, our walk in the Spirit. The book of Galatians focuses on shall live. And then the third place it's quoted is in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 we read, But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. As we all know, the book of Hebrews focuses in on the person of Jesus, but it focuses in on the idea of faith. Hebrews 10.38 leads you into Hebrews chapter 11, the great chapter on faith where it's repeated over and over and over again of how the righteous people of old live by faith. So the just, Romans, shall live, Galatians, by faith, Hebrews. Now Paul is going to take that theme of the righteousness of God and he's going to expound on it throughout the rest of the book of Romans. So let's conclude at this point. In Romans chapter 3, verse 26, we'll look at it in great detail at some point in the future, but it says the following. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He, that is God, would be just, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There's a big question that people have to deal with, and that is this. How can a righteous God allow sinners into His presence without compromising His righteousness? That's a big question. Because God cannot overlook our sin. God doesn't grade on a curve. To to get into God's presence, you have to be completely holy. There is no other way to be able to stand in the presence of a holy God. How can He be just And justify sinners. And the answer to that. Is the message of grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works. So that no one may boast. It's all of grace. It is unmerited favor. And it is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. God doesn't overlook sin. He punished sin. 
and it had to be a perfect and a holy sacrifice that would take the wrath of God on our behalf. But it can't be a finite sacrifice because it wouldn't be sufficient for all the world. But Jesus, as the God-man, would take that punishment for us so that God could maintain His righteousness, His justice, His holiness. But that God could also extend that grace toward us because His wrath has been satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ. So, as we think through everything that God has done for us, we come to this area that His righteousness can only be satisfied through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's His grace that draws us to Himself. And so I have to ask any and everybody who's watching this right now, have you trusted that God? Do you know that His righteousness has been satisfied on your behalf because that gospel is salvation to everyone who believes. Have you believed? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? If you haven't, why not do so in the privacy of your own home or wherever you happen to be watching this? Allow Christ to transform your life and it begins with you trusting Him as your personal Savior. And then begin to follow Him as Lord of your life. So would you pray with me please as we wrap up? Father, thank You. Thank You for the message of grace. Thank You, Father, that Your righteousness has been revealed. Thank You, Father, that we like Paul can uh, be and sense and feel that we are obligated but Lord, to go beyond that, that we are eager to share because of what you've done for us. Lord, help us to never be ashamed of the gospel because it is your power for salvation. God, do your work in us and through us as your people. God, would you continue to do a work in our world. Father, may you be using this virus to draw people to yourself. Lord, many people, particularly those who are older and who have health issues and particularly uh, respiratory issues, if they get this disease, they know that the, their hope doesn't seem very good. And yet, Lord, for many of those people, they know they're dying and maybe many of those people are coming to terms of peace with a holy God. God, would you use this to draw people to yourself? And would you help us as your people to live in such a way, Lord, that we are not ashamed of the gospel and that we do not bring any shame to the gospel because of the way that we live our lives. Lord, may Jesus be high and lifted up in us. And Lord, as we close now and as we hear another song, help us to, to worship you for the great God that you are and what you have revealed to us. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We'll close with a song and lift up worship and praise to our great God. Thank you. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here Working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, cause you are we make miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, cause you are we make miracle work, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I 
worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. darkness my god that is who you are 